Thanks for debate, discovery, and um, obviously trying to come to a deeper resolution. Uh, today is December 15, and uh, welcome to Seattle. My name is Jens Chapman. I'm one of the spine surgeons here. I'm glad to host you today. Today we have a fantastic visiting professor, and I'm only slightly biased. He's one of our new colleagues, Dr. Tony Wang, and I'm going to introduce him later in greater detail. Um, but he is a UVA resident in neurosurgery and uh, the fellowship at UCLA, so uh, prime locations in the US. And uh, he's going to give us some insights into a topic that is of increasing interest, and that is a spinal cord stimulation for pain control. And he's a true expert in it, having done a fellowship in functional neurosurgery. Uh, as always, we'll have a couple of cases to start uh, the discussions with and just illuminate the subject a little bit more. And three of our fellows um, are going to present. Uh, they've all come back from uh, Las Vegas, where we had uh, the Orthopedic Summit. Um, and it was a great event by Dr. Lieberman, Levine, and others. And all three presented cases here, did a very nice job with that. So they're really well in tune. Uh, so first off, we have Dr. Jared Cook. And he's going to show our first case. And we'll ask Dr. Wong, who's sitting right in front of the audience here, for his commentary. So Jared. And you've downloaded your talk already. Can I help you pop it up? I'll just check your phone real quick. All right. Hey everybody, I'm Jared Cook. I trained at Mountain View Regional Medical Center in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I'm uh, orthopedic spine. So uh, the Case here is a 59 year old female with chronic low back pain for 20 years after she fell off a cliff and uh, came to us with numbness in the posterior lateral right lower extremity uh, down to the dorsum of the foot. Uh, ambulatory with a front wheel walker at that point. She had um, chronic urinary incontinence, um, uh, unknown, unknown duration, but uh, multiple, multiple years from uh, patient's report uh, has been through extensive pain management. Um, she's gone through physical therapy, you know, and said all the um, all the low risk things, and uh, was also on um, morphine, uh, IR, and extended release, uh, multiple caudal blocks, epidural steroid injection. Um, no, uh, uh, no contribution from past medical uh, history. Uh, she had a spinal cord stimulator placed in. Uh, 2018 um, that she said worked very well for her. Unfortunately, uh, the, it appears that the leads migrated and then she had a, uh, a revision um, uh, done uh, just uh, just a week later and that subsequently got infected. So um, when she, uh, after so after she was treated, they uh, pretty much just left that alone. When she saw us, uh, she was mostly neurointact, some slight weakness and uh, right ankle dorsiflexion. Um, otherwise, uh, the EMG showed uh, uh, some subacute radiculopathy bilaterally in lower lumbar spine. And um, here were uh, her x-rays. I know there's a, a lot of markings there, essentially coronal and sagittal plane deformity um, and uh, positive uh, SVA. And um, Can you just tell us what SVA means to so a lot of people who might not know what that is? Uh, the sagittal vertical axis, basically. Um, she is leaned forward, um, puts a extra stress uh, basically everywhere. So um, she's pitched forward and just very briefly, what uh, just for the lay audience that we sometimes have on our meetings, uh, what is the exact kind of a plumb line uh, location? How does that affect the patients? Just very briefly, plain English. Uh, so you go from the, the C7 vertebral body, uh, drop a plumb line straight down and then see how far anterior to the posterior aspect of the S1 body uh, that falls. Um, and uh, patients tend to uh, tolerate up to about three um, uh, centimeters, but uh, beyond that, um, they don't tolerate it well. She's close to six. Um, so this is also uh, showing the coronal plane deformity. You can see where the, uh, where the stimulator is placed as well. Um, her uh, lumbar spine MRI, I can uh, see where basically she's having uh, neurogenic claudication, and you can see where that's uh, you know, mostly coming from, but it's also uh, levels uh, levels below this. This is pretty representative, um, however. And then uh, that T1112 is the level where the uh, stimulator leads are placed. That's also um, pretty uh, pretty stenotic, and uh, and there's also some focal kyphosis. 
So um, this is what it looks like on the um, on the CT scan. You can see these uh, these uh, kind of little uh, bright shiny things right there. Those are the leads that were placed percutaneously, and you can see them uh, actually entering here at T1112. And so the uh, the plan for her was to remove the uh, the spinal cord stimulator, which uh, was. Um, uh, which was not functioning for her at this point, whereas the first one, I don't know if I mentioned, actually did work well for her before, before those leads migrated. Uh, this uh, was not uh, helping her. Then uh, posterior fusion from uh, T9 to pelvis, uh, laminectomy T11 to uh, S1, and then uh, multiple T lifts uh, to try to correct that, um, that sagittal plane deformity as well as uh, work on the coronal plane deformity. And so these are, uh, what it looks like post-operatively. So, um, you know, it doesn't, well, I'll show you all the, all the slices. So here's, uh, here's our APs and then our laterals. You can see, um, so at this point she's, uh, she was ambulating with a front wheel walker. Uh, pain is much better controlled and the urinary symptoms have completely resolved. And here is her current alignment. Much better. So thank you for joining us today, Dr. Wong. So, um, this is a great uh, standard case. Go back to one of the more original shots. That's a great uh, summary there, Jared. Um, I want to dive right into a detail point before we discuss the bigger picture. So lead movement, uh, that's one of those uh, interesting little uh, points. We can talk about many things, the decompensated kyphoscoliosis, pervasive degeneration, stenosis, et cetera. But let's just focus on this lead thing. How do those leads uh, fit in there? Where should these uh, paddles, the electrodes, actually be located? And what is a tolerable amount of movement as the spine of the human being moves around? Sure. I think, you know, for this exact case, you know, uh, given that they... Can you make sure the microphone works? Otherwise, just tap on it. The usual... Okay, tap. There you go. Yes, they were percutaneous. Sorry about that. Um, I think, you know, for that case, uh, given that they were percutaneously placed, they probably weren't uh, secured, you know, to the lumbar fascia or even to the bone itself. Um, I've done it a couple different ways. With an open placement of a paddle electrode, you can, you know, physically see what you're doing. Frequently, uh, you can sew it to the fascia, or you can even use, like, a little dog bone plate and screw it to the lamina to prevent any movement. I think especially with the um, percutaneously, they are prone to, to lead migration. Um, you know, studies have shown maybe up to a fourth of folks will have lead migration. And, you know, regarding the exact number of, you know, how much lead migration is, you know, permissible, I think it's probably about a case-by-case -case basis. You know, if someone's getting good relief from the middle contacts, you know, if it slides, usually it slides down a little bit. If it slides down a little bit and there's still coverage of the top leads to where the, the middle leads were, I think that it could still work. Um, so I don't really have an exact kind of hard and fast number. You know, if the therapeutic leads were, say, at the, the most distal context and it slipped down, you could see that, you know, there wouldn't be any lead coverage there and it might not... Uh, be efficacious anymore. So where should paddles ideally be? Should they be the mid-thoracic spine, lower thoracic spinal cord? Sure. Uh, co uh, conus? Uh, well, it depends on where you're uh, targeting. You know, for certainly lower extremity pain, usually anywhere between uh, T8 to T12 would be a good type of uh, placement. And a lot of these trials are based on, you know, awake placement during the trial. Uh, with the percutaneous leads, they'll just under uh, local anesthesia, put in a perk lead and stimulate during the placement of and try to elicit paresthesias in the kind of the dermatomal region where the patient's experiencing their pain. So this is uh, uh, great to know. How can we as spine surgeon clinicians who are not placing these kind of complex devices identify lead migration and abnormal mobility of the lead? Sure. I think, you know, if generally lead migration pops up when someone's having, you know, good therapy for a while and they note that suddenly it's, it's not working 
or you know they've had a fall and they've noticed right after the fall something's just amiss you know kind of a sudden change in the effectiveness of the therapy and then you know to evaluate that uh, usually an AP or lateral x-ray will give you a good idea if there's been any movement or not so that's something that we should possibly contemplate then the other factor and we're going to talk about this in several iterations probably is the spine morbidity uh, this patient had a lot of problems. She had pretty significant looking stenosis, right, Jared? Yes, um, and if we put the uh, slides back up, I'm, I'm on the uh, stenosis slide. Yeah, Ben, do you mind doing that? Ben, thank you, Ben, for uh, helping us with all the technical things, and Joanne Park for uh, getting the logistics underway. Uh, so this patient had pretty significant stenosis in Definitely. some areas. So um, what are your thoughts? This is the first iteration of the same question, probably in having a patient with clear somatic problems and a beginning uh, neural element compromise and then basically, in a way, overloading the neurologic circuitry with obnoxious stimuli to, over, to mask the real cause of the problems. Sure, uh, you know, certainly this is kind of a, a typical case for where I train. We, we did a lot of these uh, thoracopelvic uh, fusions and not infrequently we'd also do a concurrent removal of spinal cord stimulator. So, you know, maybe I'm a little bit biased by my training, but I would uh, generally favor treating the underlying pathology. I know now whenever I see a patient for evaluation of this, one of the first things I get would be a long cassette x-ray, which I think, you know, might not typically be obtained out in the community. Because a lot of these folks, um, I'm not sure if your patient actually had surgery to begin with, but a lot of these folks have had multiple lammies, what have you, multiple lumbar surgeries. And you know, if you just get a lumbar x-ray and you don't see kind of the global picture, you may miss some sort of global spinal malalignment, which you know, certainly it looks like in this case was the etiology for all the patient symptoms. Super, okay. Yeah, they very often have had surgery. This one actually had not. Right. Um, Good. All right, shall we jump on to the next case? Certainly. All right, thank you, Jared. That was a really evocative case and we're looking forward to further follow-up on this patient. Next, we have Dr. Jerry Robinson, and he's going to introduce himself as to where he's from. And do you have one or two cases, Jerry? I have two cases. Two cases, excellent. All right. Uh, thanks for having me. My name's Jerry Robinson. I'm one of the Swedish Spine Fellows. I was ortho trained at Akr in Akron, Ohio, at Summa and Crystal Clinic. All right. So today's Cases, this is a 78-year-old female with a history of neurogenic bowel and bladder, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, hypothyroid, depression, anxiety, and peripheral neuropathy. She's complaining of eight months of low back pain and left lower extremity pain with numbness, tingling, and burning sensation and weakness. It's worsening uh, when they're walking for prolonged periods of time. They're currently using a walker, but they were previously independent. Their on long-term pain management strategies include uh, CBD oil, Lyrica, very high dose opioids, and multiple epidural steroid injections. Their surgical history includes some cervical laminoframinotomies, uh, L3 to 5 hemilaminotomies in the past for stenosis, and a spinal cord stimulator placed five years ago, which she says she very much dislikes. Her BMI is 26. The exam is limited by pain with a straight leg raise. They have an antalgic gait, decreased bilateral foot sensation and hypersensitivity to light touch in the feet, uh, but no formal diagnosis of CRPS or anything like that. Uh, four out of five in hip flexion, otherwise they're five out of five, and uh, decreased deep tendon reflexes in the lowers. So here you can see their standing x-rays pre-op, no um, instability on flexion and extension that you can see here, and the spinal cord stimulator placed with a battery pack. Here is their lumbar MRI with associated levels with severe, moderate severe central and severe foraminal stenosis at multiple levels with their previous laminotomies. So plan at this point uh, was to proceed wait, wait, with wait, 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 wait. All right. Let's go back. Dr. Wong, so it's great to have an expert here. So go back to the MRI. Can we see the MRI again, please, Ben? Uh, a common question is a patient has had an SCS, a spinal cord stimulator placed, 
Uh, can we do an MRI scan? Do we have to resort to a CT myelogram? Sure. Uh, what can we check with outside of calling the manufacturer to make sure it's uh, compatible? The, uh, the Medtronic system, the latest iteration of that is, is MR compatible. Um, I believe that's the one I, that's the one I have the most familiarity with. Uh, some of the other systems, uh, you know, the, uh, the Abbott, the Nevro, I'm not exactly sure of the MR compatibility, but I do know that the Medtronic one tends to be fully MR compatible. So as a uh, silly old clinician in an overloaded spine clinic, uh -huh. what should we do to test for that when, before we uh, fill out a referral for an MRI scan? How can we check? Well, uh, I mean, this is where it helps to have your uh, a contact of your, your friendly device rep, I think, to, to help query, uh, to, to, to guide you as to whether or not they are MR compatible, because it, it's a bit difficult to, to keep track of, you know, there's three or four systems out here. Some of them are older, some of them are newer. The newer ones tend to have more MR capabilities, so. Okay, fair enough. Uh, do most patients carry an identity card with them, or how do we have kind of a referral for what the patient actually bears? In sure, you know, they're given one, but in my experience, most folks aren't, you know, necessarily carrying them around in, in their back pockets, unfortunately. Yeah, that's what I've seen also. Yeah. Okay, so. Uh, Tony, I just have a question. So the nurses always say, um, when the patient has one, they kind of freak out. Mm -hmm. They go, you can't use a Bovi, you can't bipolar. Uh, give us some guidelines as to what what um, sure uh, reasonable and certainly what you recommend. I think bipolar is okay. Um, if you know, anytime anyone with a device is coming in for any sort of surgery, when I'm doing, I tell them to try to bring their controller in. Um, that way, we can just turn it off. Um, generally, I try to avoid Bovi, but you can. Um, and then just turn it back on it, it, if you're not taking it out. Uh, frequently, I, I find in, in these complex spinal cases, you're frequently taking them out for a larger revision. Um, so if, if your goal is to remove it, you know, I think Bovi, bipolar, whatever, I think is, is pretty safe. Um, if you're doing an operation to leave it in, uh, ask them to bring in the controller, turn it off, do your surgery and then turn it back on afterwards. Um, how can we in clinic uh, check for a stimulator's functionality? Uh, we obviously don't have any of the device, gadgets, mm -hmm. queries, systems with us. Can a patient do something that we can kind of uh, see or just check uh, verbally whether it works or not? Or Well, uh, frequently they have a lot of, uh, they ha might have some paresthesias from the stimulation in their you know, painful area, and uh, if they lose it for whatever reason, that's often a, a little bit of a clue uh, that maybe the device, you know, it might need some sort of interrogation or whatnot. Um, kind of similarly along those lines, if, if the efficacy goes down suddenly or, or what have you. Then another question that we've seen arise, and these are not uh, rare cases, I don't think this is a case here in question, um, we've seen occult infections in patients. Uh -huh. uh, so they're not overtly septic, there's sure. no draining wound. Um, there's kind of just a general malaise, and then when we extract them, there's a little slime pocket either around the, uh, the unit, uh, sometimes around the paddles, mm -hmm. and they're usually immune compromised patients. Um, uh, any thoughts on, should we check sed rates? Is there a little telltale sign, pocket formation, air formation, something? Some little tidbits that we as clinicians in the spine world can look for. Sure, I think, uh, you know, you mentioned a salient point. A lot of these folks um, aren't the healthiest, and certainly when you're implanting a foreign body, uh, the risk of infection goes up. I think, you know, checking a CRP, um, sed rate is a great idea. Um, I'm not sure what the, the common practice in this area is. I, I tend to, you know, regardless of the patient, tend to put some vank powder in when I put these in, just because you know, they tend to be fraught with uh, infectious complications, as you mentioned. Great, okay, Jerry, take us further. Thanks for letting me interrupt yep. you. So yep. pretty significant stenosis. Yep, and this is recurrent stenosis. They've already had a yeah. previous uh, 
laminotomies. And so the plan was to proceed with revision laminectomies, removal of the stimulator and battery pack. And then uh, there was a small durotomy uh, repaired at the time of the procedure. Uh, but the patient did well, was discharged on post-up day one, urinating on their own and ambulating without issue, no headaches or CSF problems. However, the patient was admitted to an outside hospital with severe lower extremity pain uh, after previously doing well and inability to ambulate with urinary retention. No headache, nausea vomiting, the incision didn't have any issues. And so an MRI was obtained at this outside hospital and you can see that they have uh, fluid collection uh, with uh, typical probably post-op findings, but severe uh, canal stenosis at that point in time. Because of this um, uh, good response to surgery and then abrupt decline, she was taken for exploration evacuation of seroma. No CSF leak was found. Uh, the Foley was removed. The patient is ambulatory with a walker and uh, is currently doing well with baseline strength and improved sensation with decreased opioid use at the current time. Um, so the recurrent serum, was this patient anticoagulated, just out of curiosity? I think that they were on low-dose aspirin, but not full anticoagulation. Okay. And so how long had that stimulator been in place before uh, that? It was around five years. I didn't find in the notes mm -hmm. of whether or not it was a rechargeable unit, so it may or may not have been past nice. its uh, battery life. So here comes my predictable next question. How long do these battery packs usually last? Uh, how often do they have to be serviced? How often should patients come in to see a specialist? Sure, usually about uh, three to five years. A lot of these patients are in frequent communication with the, you know, the device reps or what have you, and they're they're usually following pretty closely with uh, a pain guy, and generally they're being interrogated fairly regularly. Um, some of the rechargeable ones, like the Medtronic one, um, is kind of nice. It's it's thinner. Uh, lower profile, it, if it flips too, it's still um, rechargeable and can communicate with the, uh, the device, um, which I have seen, you know, it flip over and it, you know, loses efficacy or whatnot or, or sinks in the pocket or what have you. So you touched upon something that's kind of a new era or a new dimension in medicine. Uh, that patients actually have kind of a strong working relationship with the device reps. Mm -hmm. The device reps usually uh, are kind of a first uh, source of contact for patients. They're actually not healthcare providers, they're reps. Right. They don't have a formal health education sure. in our customary sense. So how does that work? What are your thoughts on this? Obviously kind of necessary, but it's also not really regulated, is yeah. it? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. And I wouldn't you know, pigeonhole spinal cord stimulator uh, into this, this field. It is kind of not the only one. I mean, we see it with, you know, and stuff I do, deep brain stimulation. A lot of those patients have very close contacts with the device reps and, you know, uh, will often kind of be like the first line of, you know, I go, oh, I got something going on. And they'll, they'll, they'll contact the device rep. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, certainly industry has helped a lot and to push the field forward. Um, and I kind of touch on this in my talk a little bit, but uh, a lot of these studies um, you'll see are, are um, directly, you know, financed or, or partnered with industry. So you, you might have to take a little bit of a grain of a salt, grain of salt when, when you know, reading these papers. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. So uh, anything else on this patient? Otherwise, this is Dr. Oskurian's patient? Yep. Uh, Rod, any thoughts on her? If you go back to the images, please, Ben. So this is obviously one of those uh, spines with significant problems, stenosis, et cetera. Um, uh, nice decompression and then uh, questions around the device. Any, any clinical vignettes you can share with us? I mean, the main thing I think is once these patients get, she sort of, they kind of turn into a chronic pain patient and that she stopped getting imaging. They just kept giving her more and more narcotics and kind of, you know, it's like you have, a, it's like getting a pacemaker. I think stimulators really do work um, in the right patient. Um, uh, unfortunately, what happens is once they get put in, they get lost to follow up. The primary care doctor doesn't know what, the, what you know, what the hell to order. Sure. So they get kind of like, it's like having a pacemaker. It's, it's almost a curse sometimes. They can't get any imaging. I mean, li literally, she like could not walk 100 yards. So I think that's the only thing. I think when you do get one, I just get a CT myelogram. You know, there's, there's nothing wrong with getting a CT myelogram. 
So, and image him like crazy. So, uh, first of all, shout out to some of our regular listeners and participants. Dr. Kaplan, good morning. And it's nice to see you, uh, Dr. Medisa Madera. Uh, a great question by Dr. Charanjit Dilon, um, uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, does a spinal cord stimulator interfere with cardiac pacemakers? And are there any other special precautions we should think about in uh, pacemaker patients? I haven't heard of it. Uh, usually it's kind of a, a, a distance thing. You know, some of the other stimulators that we put on the, the chest for, you know, deep brain stimulation or vagal nerve stimulation might have interference uh, with um, ICD or a pacemaker just due to the vicinity. Uh, but these being, you know, on typically the opposite side of the body, one in the upper chest, one usually kind of in the low flank, um, I haven't personally had any issues with, with that. And uh, Dr. Foda Sosian, nice to have you on board also. Uh, the other question is, um, we're seeing more and more patients with um, bladder sphincter uh, stimulators. Is that compatible with spinal cord stimulation? You mean like conus stimulation no, or? they actually have bladder sphincter stimulation. So they have little leads in their uh, oh, okay. genital system. I see. Um, you know, I haven't personally seen that. Um, in any of the patients I've seen, uh, you know, bladder or, or sphincter stimulation. But from what I've read, you know, there's certainly folks who have different types of stimulators of the spinal column and kind of the peripheral nerves in place, you know, in the same patient. Great. Any thoughts from you on the case then, Jerry? Um, I, the next case will bring up some questions okay, about um, potentially failed back syndrome and what do you technically call that? Or it seems like this catch-all term that sure. may or may not include organic pathology. And so that could be a potential discussion for the next one. Sure. All right, go for it. Yeah, so the next case is a 72-year-old female with low back pain and lower extremity radiculopathy in the left leg, specifically the hip and anterior thigh. Uh, they had short-term thigh and hip pain relief with an epidural steroid injection. Uh, long distances caused more pain. They have numbness and tingling with prolonged standing for about a minute. They are using a walker and used to be independent, but they deny any bowel or bladder symptoms. You can see their long list of uh, medical history there. They are on denosumab for osteoporosis and a low T-score. They've had a previous L3 to S1 posterior spinal fusion in 2007 that did relieve their symptoms. Their new symptoms are different. Their BMI is 19 with a straight leg raise, five out of five lowers and decreased deep, deep tendon reflexes. Here you can see their imaging on full uh, scoliosis films, 20 degree scoliosis above the previous fusion with lateral esthesis, lumboid lordosis around 45, PI of 66, their mismatch around 21 degrees. They have a eight centimeter SVA and their ODI is uh, recorded at 67. <coughs> what does an ODI of 67 mean? Is that a bad number or a good number? Yeah, so it's a measure of uh, their disability, and it can be kind of broadly applied to various pathologies across the board, and they can be kind of used to compare different pathologies, although they are So just different. give us a gestalt. What's an ODI of zero mean? What's an ODI of 100? Zero being non-disabled and higher number 100 being completely disabled or bedbound. Yeah, bedbound, yeah. So 67 is what? Uh, crippled or very high. I think bad. they have varying degrees of yeah. intervals. I don't have those specific So this is a significant memorized. disability. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm kind of missing something here. Uh, where are the rods? Yeah. So I did put in some pictures here. You can see, uh, if you can look at my, I put the uh, cursor here where you can see radiolucent, either like carbon fiber rods or some kind of radiolucent rod that was performed earlier. So I did what, notice what that, that initially in? that I didn't know. What year was that put in? Uh, 2007. So this would probably not be carbon fiber, this would be peak. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's Actually, it was dynesis. They were like this is a dynesis system? Yeah. Okay. What is that, Rod? It was done in Philadelphia. What was, what's a dynesis um, system? It's basically like a dynamic fusion device, and it's a, I don't know what it's made of, but it's like a, basically, it's, it's like a rubber a, band. Yeah, it's like a <laughs> string. Hmm. It's like a... It's a biphasic yeah. or triphasic uh, rubber band composite. Yeah, and it's got... And it's coated with plastic. What was the biomechanical concept behind that? Honestly, I don't know. 
I mean, Honestly, nobody knows. <laughs> I don't it, it know. Those, it was one of those great mystery devices. Yeah. Uh, the theoretical concept yeah. was that in a straight spine, you could tension this uh, rubber band system against the screws and offload a damaged disc. But to avoid overcompression, they put a plastic tube in between that that you'd compress against. So there's kind of a plastic sleeve around it that undoubtedly you saw. Wow. And then you compress against that. So. Uh, it was kind of a load offload thing. How that is supposed to help a patient with a degenerative scoliosis is beyond all thoughts. And again, uh, there's actually no interest in doing a fusion. So they were supposed to be a motion preserving technology. Oh, I didn't know that, okay. So there's actually not a pseudarthrosis. Yeah. This is supposed to stabilize the spine and prevent uh, further progression of disease. But the interesting thing here for me here is to see something like that is the significant arthritis that's happening above this. And um, it obviously did stabilize something, but... Um, yeah, it's I guess I was confused by the inner body devices. This so it is seems an like interesting you have case, um, because go back to the original images. She uh, lived in Philadelphia and was being followed by um, the Rothman group there who did the surgery. And then she was given the option of... Uh, they told her that um, she could have a spinal cord stimulator or an intrathecal pain pump, huh. and uh, yep. she's really thin. Yep. And um, she, I think, did the trial there before moving. She moved here like during the pandemic to live with her daughter, and um, she had a really difficult time trying to decide. Um, and she's not a chronic pain patient at all. Like very motivated, um, yeah, has she's a legitimate school teacher, like a yeah, good functioning individual. Yeah, very functional, you know, and had mostly leg pain and um, uh, ridiculous symptoms um, and completely um, incapacitated with radiculopathy. Um, and so that was kind of the, the, so when she got, so when she moved, the Rothman um, group said, hey, go follow up with these guys at Swedish. Um, and she saw me and she didn't really think she'd be a surgical candidate. I didn't either, but I kind of saw her and, and we went over stuff. So this, I thought it would be a good case for um, Dr. Wong to see you know, would she be a good candidate for a simulator or a pump or a surgery, maybe? So, um, Dr. Wang, you're obviously a board certified or beginning to be a board certified neurosurgeon, and you've done extensive training in some of the prime places in the country, University of Virginia, uh, UCLA. Undoubtedly, you've run across this topic of, quote, failed back syndrome. Sure. And undoubtedly, this is a topic that is heavily used in the spinal cord stimulator world. What is this failed back syndrome? I generally think of, and you know, it's, it's a bit of a moving target as, as you kind of alluded to, but I would generally classify as failed back syndrome as someone who has undergone spine surgery, uh, who has no sort of radiographic compression of, you know, the fecal sac or the neural foramen, who continues to have some sort of, you know, neuropathic radicular pain in the lower extremities. That, that would be kind of my own personal Definition. So no major structural or no, element yeah, uh, no. compromise. Great. Yeah, I think that's a very serviceable uh, um, definition, and it's sad to see how that moniker is applied to a lot of people. It, it, lots of things get thrown in, under that umbrella. In some of my literature review, I did find that they lump those people, even who have organic pathology, into failed back syndrome sure. and qualify them as spinal cord stimulator uh, recipients, even with organic pathology, so. So this patient has had how many spine procedures now, roughly? Uh, just just the one, just the one. three to one, uh, I guess, offloading. Stabilization. Stabilization. With a single uh, level fusion. Hybrid uh, fusion slash stabilization. And now here you can see their MRI findings. Uh, I put a representative cut of that left-sided frame and it's completely occluded there at L1-2 uh, and L2-3. Uh, Dr. Skurian, this is your patient again? Yeah. Thank you for being such a contributor to the cases today. Did you do a CT myelogram on the patient? Um, I don't think we did, because uh, it was pretty clear on the MRI where the pathology was. Okay. And it fit exactly with her uh, symptoms. So it's a combination of structural problems and of neurologic problems? Yes. Okay. Do you do anything to prehabilitate a patient like this? I mean, she, she did for years, um, and <clears throat> We kind of gave her the options, and um, you know, we. In fact, this is the other issue I think is is that, 
you know, because of her age and all the things that she'd gone through, and she had the surgery years ago, I think she was pretty well informed. I mean, she basically came in and said, look, you know, I know what's going on. She, she went had through. all her reports. Yeah. She had completely, I mean, this is the most um, uh, uh, educated, uh, she's a teacher. I mean, she's she's like, look, I've done it. I've done all the conservative stuff. She jumped she through even multiple said hoops, it. She goes, yeah. I'm, she goes, I'm not a chronic pain patient, <laughs> and um, I have no secondary gain here. I want to have my leg pain taken care of. So Dr. Dillon again comments correctly, this is a very unusual case because the Dynasys system is not a fusion device, a stabilization yeah. device. So in a case like this, if you want to protect the adjacent segments, which some people did, uh, you would use a metal rod on the fusion segment, try to correct that uh, deformity. Sorry about this, I'm on call. And uh, then use uh, the, uh, the dynamic stabilization at the levels above and below. So having a rubber band kind of uh, elastic system over a fusion level does not make sense. Thank you, why don't you proceed? Yep, so the plan uh, was T10 to pelvis revision, decompression, and fusion. Uh, for the correction of her deformity and uh, compression, as well as L2-3 and L5-S1 inner bodies. Here you can see the post-operative CT with excellent alignment. And then you can see post-operatively the patient is doing well with improved posture and uh, improved strength. There is a small T10 uh, compression fracture with about 10% height loss and she's being referred uh, for kyphoplasty of those above levels. Um, and so questions or discussion at this point. So uh, Rod, this is your case. Uh, so did you do these cages above and below uh, from the backside? Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts in terms of which levels you wanted to instrument and supplement and how'd you get this nice deformity correction? Um, so uh, I think we tried to, I mean, as you could see she had pretty severe L5 radiculopathy. So my goal really was, my con I wanted to concentrate at L5-S1. She also did have a little bit of an L2 radiculopathy. And so we tried to get some correction at the levels above. And um, unfortunately, a lot of these devices kind of peter out. And um, this one, I wish uh, we um, got a little bit more distraction, but that's what we could get. And um, we got pretty good alignment. I just saw her in clinic and she's doing great. She has no symptoms, and the only reason I sent her for kyphoplasty is because you can see she's got a little bit of a compression fracture already in developing PJK, so hopefully yes. Dr. David will um, intervene. Do you do anything to uh, One second, speak pre yeah. prevent PJK? You use a tether? I wish. Like no, I don't currently do anything for it. Yeah, there was a recent, there, uh, uh, we saw like 500-something articles on PJK, proximal junctional kyphosis. Wow. One of the steadfast findings is, <coughs> excuse me, is um, the uh, presence of screws at the very top without some form of a hook system or cables does seem to predispose uh, postmenopausal large females more than others, and the spine basically cracks through the pedicle screw insertion site. Glenn, uh, can you pass the microphone to Dr. Okay. David? We're joined by Dr. David, who's uh, a chief of interventional procedures here. Um, can you augment a vertebra where there's screws in there that's starting to fail, and how do you do that? Uh, yeah, so we're looking at uh, trying to either go over top of the screw to enter the body, or obviously if we were in the lumbar area, we, a lot easier, uh, we could go uh, right into the body. Uh, but in this case, we look to probably try and get into the uh, body uh, by getting right just below that uh, the screws bilaterally. Okay, and uh, would you also at the same time augment the vertebral level above the instrumentation, or as we call it, the UIV plus one? That can be done as well uh, if that's uh, if that's needed, and that would be obviously quite helpful to. Uh, Jerry, what was the um, the bone density as identified in Hounsfield units? I did not measure the Hounsfield units, but she had a form of dec formal DEXA that was negative three point. One, Whoa. I think, at the femoral neck, Ooh. and she was on denosumab therapy. Yeah, you said that. that. How long had you been on that? Uh, it's unclear from our notes. Just it's it's hard to parse that out. But she's certainly a high risk patient. Uh, and her BMI was 19, and she yeah. had been treated non-operatively for a couple of years to try to up that. So significant risk factor for. Did you put in PJK. a brace after surgery? Uh, I 
I don't, but I don't remember that. Mm -hmm. Probably right. not. So yeah, so I think sending her for an early virtual plus is a good idea. One more case. This is uh, one last case presentation here. Uh, the patient in question is a 65-year-old female who's presenting with uh, chronic back and neck pain, uh, as well as positional headaches. Uh, patient is exceptionally complex. She's had an extensive surgical history, uh, over 40 surgeries total, and, and more than 20 spine procedures. Uh, she had a spinal cord stimulator placed uh, three, year, three years prior to presentation, uh, as well as an intrathecal pump um, uh, that was delivering uh, Dilaudid and Bupivacaine uh, six years prior to presentation. Uh, she also carries a diagnosis of arachnoiditis uh, for, uh, for 10 years prior to presentation that was a, a complication of one of her previous spinal procedures. Uh, on physical exam, the patient has some uh, slight weakness of bilateral hip flexion uh, and some more profound weakness of right dorsiflexion and the right EHL. Uh, otherwise, her sensation and reflexes are normal. Um, several SI joint uh, eliciting techniques did yield pain on physical exam. Uh, and she also has multiple well-heeled well incisions with um, uh, with no evidence of leakage or infection. Uh, this, these are her plain films. Uh, you know, you can see evidence of, of multiple prior spinal procedures, and on the far left and far, far uh, right, uh, I've zoomed in on the uh, spinal cord stimulator leads and the, uh, the entry point for the intrathecal catheter uh, that the patient has. Uh, this is her MRI, um, and it demonstrates a uh, fluid collection uh, posterior to the fecal sac in the in the you know lower lumbar region. Um, so, given these findings, uh, there was a Set hands. Uh, so, uh, sorry. So, Dr. Wong, this is a patient with a double um, battery pack system now. So, there's an. A standard spinal cord stimulator, and then there's an intrathecal pain pump. So right. uh, does that make sense somewhere, and what's the rationale for that? How often is that successful? I, you know, I've seen it uh, in, in some chronic pain patients. You know, how often is it successful? Uh, hard to say. You know, the thing that I kind of uh, jumped out at me just looking at this is, uh, you know, I, there's no measurement, of, but it, I'm sure there's some sort of uh, pelvic incidence, lumbar lordosis mismatch. You know, look at the back; it looks quite, quite flat. Um, you know, um, so how successful those two therapies would be in this patient, I personally would have my doubts. But yeah. I guess we'll see. <laughs> she actually told us. So this is interesting for me to learn. I learn from every patient in a way, and uh, some teach me more than others, uh, she felt a strong capability of differentiating the spinal cord stimulator benefit from her intrathecal pump. How realistic is that the patient can differentiate those two inputs? Um, you know, it, it's not implausible. Um, certainly, classically, the spinal cord stimulator kind of elicits this, you know, pleasant paresthesia, uh, whereas, you know, the intrathecal pump generally wouldn't, so. I saw some statistics that the uh, rate of placement of intrathecal pumps has dropped dramatically. Um, is that true, and why would that be? Uh, you know, certainly we didn't do a lot of pumps placement for pain uh, where I trained. It was generally kind of a, a last ditch thing, and it, it usually tended to be in folks who had not, not so much spinal issues, but more, you know, like uh, malignancy-related pain. Mm -hmm. Is it more potent, just on a side note, than spinal cord stimulus to have an intrathecal pump? And wh what was the purported benefit of that technology? Well, you know, I'm sure for something like this, it was, you know, I don't know, did she get the spinal cord stimulator first? Is that uh, what happened? Yeah, so uh, the spinal cord stimulator was placed uh, second, and it was placed second. three years prior to presentation. The pump was placed six years prior to mm -hmm. presentation. Mm -hmm. It might have been something where she got some sort of uh, chronic pain and maybe she was given a trial dose and the trial dose helped her and they went along with this this pain pump and it might have gotten her, you know, you know, all these kind of therapies at the end of the day, they, 
just symptomatic treatments, right? Um, as your symptoms progress, they can get worse, and you know the therapy that's masking the symptoms may no longer be as efficacious. So these um, intrathecal pumps have to be reloaded. I read some statistics somewhere that there's a very high, maybe you can elucidate the number a little bit more, uh, incidence of having these um, uh, catheter tips actually be colonized with a, a bacterial thrombus. So what are your thoughts on that and uh, how often does that happen? Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a purported uh, infection with uh, these types of intrathecal pain pumps, probably around 5 to 15 percent. Um, and as you mentioned, you know, if you have to get it refilled, you're basically just going to the skin. So, you know, every time you do that, you do raise the, the chance of intrathecal or, you know, device-related infection. Great. Uh, and then go to the CT myelogram, if you will. Uh, there's, there's no myelogram available. There's just the, the MRI. I, there is a myelogram, but you yeah, it, it wasn't it wasn't loading in the system, unfortunately. Okay, yeah. So, what did the myelogram show that we can't uh, uh, visualize right now? And what do you purport, or what do, what do you get from the MRI scan here? Well, the MRI demonstrates you know this large fluid collection, which is concerning for a pseudo meningocele. Uh, and then I believe the uh, the myelogram, as as documented, showed uh, a contrast leakage along the catheter tract. So, so kind of an extrusion of of uh, uh, contrast even from the contained area. Of the, of the pseudo meningocele. So how often is it that you see ongoing leakage? Uh, and by volume, the CT myelogram is pretty impressive. Hmm. It's a pretty substantial leakage. How often does that so it's, happen? So it's leaking from, from the... From the insertion site in the... Oh, wow. Uh, I would say from the site itself, you know, I think rates of CSF leak are probably around 5%, but, uh, you know, from the actual catheter site itself, it's, it's something I haven't personally seen before. That, that must be a, quite, quite the image to, to be wholesome. Well, should, we, should we publish that? Because uh, the CT myelogram is pretty impressive. She has a <laughs> around that. Um, by the way, Dr. Dillon has been very active today in the chat room. I thank, we thank him for that. So uh, Dr. Dillon points out that uh, there is a role for intrathecal baclofen and uncontrolled spasticity. Uh, if, so he finds that there's a very good justification for having both an intrathecal system for baclofen administration and uncontrolled spasticity, and then neuropathic pain, obviously, spinal cord stimulator. So uh, uh, this wasn't baclofen, though, was it? This no. was not baclofen. This is opiates. So this is a, exactly bingo. This patient received both intrathecal morphine, I believe, and a substantial dose of that, actually. Dilaudid and bupivacaine. The, the, thank you, the dilaudid and bupivacaine, and then had a spinal cord stimulator. So belt suspenders, strings, <laughs> and Indeed. ropes, and whatever. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, why don't you carry on? So what do we do? Uh, and it's actually good that uh, baclofen was brought up because uh, one of the first things that was done in anticipation of uh, uh, revision and removal of some of these devices uh, was that the patient was directed to her pain provider to wean her off of the medications. Uh, Dilaudid and bupivacaine are, are slightly lower risk for withdrawal. She wasn't on baclofen, thankfully, which is a much higher risk for withdrawal, and, and my understanding is can be fatal if not properly titrated. Um, so after her, uh, her weaning was complete, she went for uh, hardware revision uh, bilateral uh, non-instrumented SI fusion, a removal of the intrathecal pain pump with uh, dural closure augmentation and reconstruction, uh, and then uh, wound closure with our plastic surgery colleagues. Uh, this was a recent case, and she's uh, she's doing well uh, at one month, uh, you know, postoperatively with with mostly improved uh, positional headaches. And this is just just her imaging. You know, the the hardware construct was was taken to the. Uh, to the pelvis, uh, you know, for further SI stabilization, and there was also some uh, some deformity correction performed. So the patient had a partial non -union. We did not do a major deformity correction because she had been through a lot of surgery, and sure. we felt that more trauma would not ne necessarily lead to a incremental increase in wellness. Uh, so, and she wanted to leave her intrathecal pump in place, which, uh, sorry, the, the spinal, spinal cord, cord stimulator cord. in place, which we did. So you mentioned that a little bit earlier, some tips and tricks in terms of how can we avoid injury to those leads? Uh, do we turn the device off before? Uh, can we use standard electrocautery, which is so convenient because we can find the cables and Absolutely, burn along yeah. them, or do we destroy them? Um, yeah, so I, I don't know if you guys have it here. The, the plasma blade is a good thing to use. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we would use that uh, frequently. Um, and, you know, just turning it off, turning it back on. So we, we turned the stimulator pack off before. Yeah, we did that. And what's a plasma blade? 
I don't know about that. I can, I can comment on that as I, I helped yes. develop the Plasma Blade many years ago. Okay. Uh, yeah. it, the, the Plasma Blade is a, it's an alternative to standard electrocautery. It uses a, a pulse sequence that's, that's uh, significantly different from the regular bovi. Uh, it minimizes tissue heating and tissue trauma. So when you do histology on incisions that have been made with the Plasma Blade, they're actually, uh, they have less peripheral tissue damage than even a mechanical blade. This is news to me, so this is great. So do we have it here? Uh, we do not. <laughs> okay. Your development has not been adopted here yet. Uh, we need to change that's that. maybe something we can change. Yes. All right, very good. So uh, Rod, from a spine surgery standpoint, I did not do a big further deformity correction. We did an opportunistic mm -hmm. partial decompression, but uh, this lady has been through 20 spine surgeries or so before. What are your thoughts? I think it's I think a very reasonable operation that you did. The only thing is, um, do you think the stimulator is still? Uh, she felt, uh, we talked about this earlier, yeah, yeah. she felt very strongly that she could uh, derive and feel a benefit. I asked Tony about that earlier. And, yeah. Uh, he felt, yes, uh, patients can can really uh, reflect on that and experience mm -hmm. a benefit. So I thought that was interesting because she was very clear that that was helpful. Uh, she was all in favor of getting yeah. rid of the IT pump. And what was the mixture, what was in the uh, pump? Delighted and BPVK. Okay. I mean, it's always hard when you got both going on to figure out what's doing what. So I think removing one and leaving the other is totally reasonable. And I think Tony can go back in and. Now we sent the out. catheter tip <laughs> off. Revision. Anything grow from that? I actually didn't check that. Didn't see any positive yeah. results. But she did have that little fibrin plug, uh, that tail sitting off of it. So sure. Uh, so we did send, a smart move to uh, send it off. Should we put those into a saline bath? Just a technical thing. I heard different things about how to optimize chances for recovery of a microorganism. Oh, to, to put it that in. That little tail, yeah. Yeah, I, I think that, that I didn't can't do hurt. That. I didn't I mean, do it. But I assume she's she's fine now, yeah? Uh, she's recovering. Yeah. I don't think she's cured. Uh, she's definitely improved substantially. She's better, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so and we repaired the dural sac, obviously, and glued it and everything like that. I think we had our plastic surgeon, Dr. Gottlieb, help us with the soft tissue closure, so she's had no wound healing problems. Uh, Rod, I have a technical question. Dr. Dillon, again, has been super active and uh, really impressive. So what are your thoughts on the rostral segment uh, protection to um, place the screws in a caudally directed, so a true lanky fashion? rather than putting them parallel to the end plates. Why would one thing help more than uh, the other for PJK prevention? You no, know, honestly, I think all these are great. You know, it's good to think about how to prevent it. I just don't know. Even tethering, I mean, I don't think anything's worked. Yeah, that was a big yeah. focus in that meeting that we were in uh, Las Vegas. We had a whole session on that. And we had an amazing compilation of surgeons. And for instance, Dr. Polly uh, showed something I had not thought of before, that is when we uh, use kind of aggressive tools to put in our proximal screws, we may actually create an iatrogenic stress fracture at the upper pedicle level. Rod, have you ever seen that or heard yeah. of that? Oh yeah, I mean, I think those are all legitimate reasons to, um, uh, to not, you know, to try to th figure out ways to protect the vertebral body that you're working on. Yeah, so you want to do a soft implantation. Yeah. Great. So yes, thank you for that, and we want to thank our other fellows, uh, Jared and Jerry, for their presentations. Uh, Dr. Robinson had to run down to an emergency uh, case that just came into the ER. It's a great privilege to introduce, uh, again, Dr. Tony Wong. Uh, he, uh, do you want to come up to the front? Yeah. Sure. Um, he's one of our faculty members here, so I'm highly conflicted. Um, uh, but um, uh, we're lucky to have him here. He did his medical school at Wayne State University in Detroit, Michigan and he did his residency in the famous neurosurgery program at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville uh, under the directorship of Dr. Shaffrey, John Jane Jr., Jeff Elias, and many others. It's a, a, an amazing program. And um, he then did a fellowship in functional epilepsy surgery at UCLA with Dr. Sneda Paradian and Dr. Bari and also Dr. Freed. So he does functional neurosurgery. He already showed his clinical acumen and wisdom in several of these uh, cases that we presented this morning. And we're looking forward to him providing us with a larger uh, survey of functional neurosurgery as applied to the spinal cord stimulator um, technology. So thanks for being here, Tony. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chapman. Thank you for the, the kind and, and warm welcome. And thank you to everyone here at the uh, uh, SSF for, for having me speak to you today about spinal cord stimulation. 
uh, no disclosures to report here. You know, spinal cord stimulation has been around for a while. Uh, in the past 60 years, there's been a uh, slow and steady growing amount of literature. You know, last week when I did this search, there was over 25,000 articles about spinal cord stimulation. I'm sure if you did that today, it would be even a little higher than, than that number you see there. If you go on the clinicaltrials.gov site, you see over 700 trials for spinal cord stimulation for a variety of conditions. See, most of these involve the central nervous system as well as pain. You have pain, back pain, chronic pain. If you dive into the weeds a little bit and go to the rare diseases categories, you'll find even more categories that are under investigation, including some that were kind of a surprise to me, including ALS, you have glioma, GBM, so on and so forth. And so with so many studies and so many papers for so many indications and conditions, how do we, you know, how are we to make sense of all of this? Um, you know, one thing is certainly to take advice from, from experts. And I've included this table from one of the seminal textbooks in functional neurosurgery which uh, highlights the relative success of SCS for a variety of conditions. I wanted to highlight a few conditions here for which you know, we typically see uh, folks for, uh, I see referrals for CRPS, you know, chronic regional pain syndrome one and two, diabetic neuropathy, and then we have you know, low back pain combined with uh, leg neuropathy. You know, this is generally what I would think is what's lumped into this quote, failed back surgery syndrome as well as axial spine pain. Uh, notably, I, I do wanna highlight that you know, low back pain combined with leg neuropathy and axial spinal pain are, are classified in this success variable column as well as this failure uh, is more likely than success column. Um, you know, however, I do want to state that you know this is just expert opinion. Expert opinion is just that it's 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 opinion at the end of the day. Um, what does the the data show? And I wanted to highlight kind of the, some of the seminal papers for uh, CRPS and diabetic neuropathy before spending most of the talk on uh, failed back syndrome and back pain. Uh, this is an old study, but a good one from uh, 20 years ago in the New England Journal of Medicine looking at spinal cord stimulation for uh, CRPS. They did a single-centered uh, randomized control trial. They randomized about 54 patients in a two-to-one manner uh, for spinal cord stimulation and non-operative treatment. Uh, they looked at outcome measures including uh, visual analog scale, global perceived effect, functional status, and health-related quality of life at six-month follow-up. And here are the results. You see the baseline uh, VAS scores are pretty high of 7.1 in SCS group and 6.7 in the non-op group. Um, Want to draw your attention to here. You see that 18 patients were in kind of in the medical group, uh, and they had very, you know, modest or, you know, basically no change in their VAS scores. Of the 36 patients that were funneled in or randomized to the SCS trial, only 24 of them got implanted. Uh, these other 12 that didn't get implanted didn't have a positive trial. Um, so that means during their you know, one week trial, they didn't meet the 50% or greater um, kind of prerequisite to proceed for permanent implantation. So there's two ways of looking at this. You can uh, look at the patients who ended up with the implant. Among these patients, they saw an average of uh, 3.6 decrease in VAS scores. If you, you know, take a little more you know, harsher look and look at intention to treat analysis, uh, it drops a little bit to a 2.4 uh, improvement in VAS, which um, is, is still a good improvement compared to essentially nothing with medical therapy. And you'll see that uh, patients were generally uh, satisfied. They felt they perceived themselves to be in a better state than they were uh, after the fact. 
I will say though that while the stimulation improved pain and uh, global perceived effect, it didn't result in any changes in functional status of the hand or leg or change in health related quality of life. This is only six month follow up, so you may state, well, maybe if uh, the stimulation went on a little longer, they might see some benefit. And so the authors, they published um, two year and five year follow up for these patients, which they published in Annals of Neurology as well as uh, the JNS. And here are kind of the take home results. Um, you'll see at baseline, these are their uh, VAS scores. And they had pretty good patient retention. You know, at two years, they only lost one patient from the SCS group and two patients from the medical group. Two year results were pretty comparable in terms of intention to treat analysis uh, with the SCS attaining about a 30% relative improvement in VAS scores. However, at five years, you'll see maybe the SCS was a bit more um, modest. However, we did see some gains in pain improvement in the non-op group. And in fact, at uh, five years, this was no longer significantly different between the two groups. And um, while they published specifically five-year outcome data, they note that actually by the time three years was, uh, you know, by the time they had their three-year follow-up, the results were no longer statistically significant. However, it's uh, interesting, you, when you ask these SCS patients, uh, you know, given your outcome, would you still elect to have the same treatment? And even though there weren't any statistically significant differences in pain, 95% uh, of the SCS patients said they felt it was, you know, worth their while. And so the authors kind of, uh, the, the basically speculate as to why this could be. They touched upon, you know, perhaps uh, patients exaggerated the efficacy during the trial period. Uh, they also point to potential spontaneous improvement in CRPS. Yeah, I don't, I don't know how much weight I would put in that. Uh, CRPS is generally pretty poorly treated with medical therapy alone. But it is uh, interesting that, uh, you know, while the, the pain uh, numbers perhaps weren't as good, uh, patients were still satisfied. So I just want to touch very briefly on SCS for diabetic neuropathy, and then we'll, we'll jump into to back pain. This is just one uh, pretty high quality study, multi-center RCT out of Europe, uh, comparing SCS for uh, diabetic neuropathy to conventional medical management. They randomized 60 patients, and they, they saw a pretty profound uh, decrease in VAS of almost 60% relative decrease for SCS while the non op folks basically didn't improve at all. And so uh, leading into, you know, failed back surgery syndrome, you know, it's estimated to be present in up to 10 to 40% of back surgery patients. Uh, SCS has, long, has a long history uh, in uh, spinal surgery, and it's generally thought of is kind of a last resort, at least that was kind of my teaching, you know, address kind of any sort of malalignment issues, any neural compression, and then if they're still having symptoms, consider SCS. And so this is a randomized uh, control study out of Hopkins published in 2005, published in neurosurgery, where they compared uh, SCS to repeat lumbosacral uh, spine surgery. As I mentioned, single center, uh, a sm relatively small amount of patients, but randomized. Uh, 50 patients randomized between SCS and reoperation. Uh, it is uh, interesting to note that in order to be a candidate, you had to have imaging findings uh, that showed neural compression. So this is generally not perhaps the ideal patient that I would consider for SCS, but this is what they chose. They defined a reoperation as laminectomy, foraminotomy, or discectomy. Uh, they specifically excluded any patients who had, uh, you know, a spondy or who needed a fusion, and they specifically excluded patients whose main complaint was back pain 
as opposed to radicular, whether that be hip, buttock, or leg pain. And they define success as at least a 50% uh, reduction in pain. And they had several endpoints. They looked at how many people crossed over, uh, what was your success at last follow-up, and improvement in any sort of daily activities, uh, neurologic status, and medication use. So here are the results. Um, crossover rates. Uh, you see a relative small amount of SCS patients elected to cross over to repeat spine surgery. Only five out of the 24, or about 20%, elected to cross over. For the folks who are assigned or randomized to repeat lumbo lumbosacral spine surgery, more than half of them uh, elected to cross over to SCS. So that that you know maybe should tell you kind of the efficacy of the uh, the reoperation. At least it pertains to these patients. And at last follow-up, uh, they lost uh, five patients from the SCS group, but almost 50% reported at least a 50% improvement in pain. And this was uh, significantly better than the folks randomized to reoperation, uh, who only 12% of them uh, repeated or reported the, uh, the primary outcome of uh, improvement of 50% in pain. Uh, secondary outcomes such as functional status, you know, returning to work, uh, walking, climbing stairs were not statistically different between SCS and the reoperation groups. Uh, the reoperation group, however, did have a higher uh, use of opioid drugs. Um, you know, this is a, an interesting study. However, you know, it's not exactly clear to me what reoperation meant. And you know, generally speaking, I would tend to you know, reserve SCS for folks who don't sort of have any sort of anatomic explanation for their, their pain. And so this carries us into a, one of the kind of the, the seminal trials in the spinal cord world, spinal cord stimulator world called the PROCESS trial. This was a multi-center uh, trial based in Canada and Europe as well as Israel uh, that assigned patients randomly between continued medical management and SCS for failed back surgery syndrome. And uh, the inclusion criteria were folks diagnosed with failed back surgery syndrome with predominantly leg pain. Um, so you were excluded if your main complaint was primarily back pain, your pain had to be five or more, and you had to have a history of a successful surgery for herniated disc. So, they weren't exactly clear on what this meant, but I interpreted this to mean that, you know, they had a discectomy or whatnot, and then follow-up imaging didn't show any sort of uh, neural compression or any sort of anatomic reason for their pain. Their main uh, primary outcome was a 50% or more reduction in VAS at six months, and secondary outcomes, they looked at back pain, a health-related quality of life, uh, ODI, pain medications, and satisfaction. And here we have the results for the primary outcome, which uh, as mentioned was improvement in your leg pain at six months. And at six months they had pretty good patient uh, retention, only two patients from the SES group and four patients from the non-op group uh, dropped out. Here we have the number of folks who attained the primary outcome. And you see you have really good results here for SES at six months. Uh, just about half of the patients attained the primary outcome as opposed to only about 10% of the non-op patients. The, if you look at it at a kind of a more granular level of the mean decreases in VAS, you'll see that SES uh, led to an approximate 50% decrease in uh, pain scores while non-op uh, was much more modest at about 10%. So secondary outcomes, they saw significant improvements in back pain, uh, health-related quality of life, and functional status, uh, no significant differences in pain meds, including opioids, NSAIDs, antidepressants, or anticonvulsants. I just wanted to touch briefly on the back pain specifically. As you'll see here, uh, their baseline scores were a little bit lower than their leg pain scores. Um, this was a statistically significant change, but you see it's a little bit more modest than the leg pain. The leg pain decreased about 50%. You see back pain here uh, decreased only about 25%, uh, which is, you know, may maybe a little bit more modest, but uh, a lot better than non-op uh, management. We see actually uh, 
got worse in the, the six month period. And so this uh, group also published long-term results at two years looking at uh, leg and back pain. And after six months, you were allowed to cross over. Um, at the end of the trial, uh, four of the 46 patients that were still available for follow-up crossed over from SCS to uh, medical management. And uh, conversely, of the 41 patients that they still had at two-year follow-up, about three-fourths of them crossed over to SCS. So you see a high kind of asymmetric uh, amount of crossing over. And here's kind of a flow chart. Uh, remember the primary outcome is uh, a decrease in your leg VAS score of 50% or more. And it's a little bit of a busy um, uh, diagram here, but if we look at, you see the 52 patients here were assigned to SES, 48 were assigned to medical management. If you take a very harsh view and you, know, you classify everyone who withdrew or was lost to follow up or who crossed over as a failure, you'll see that 17 of these original 52 patients achieved their primary outcome, which was a 50% or more decrease in leg pain. So that represents about 33% of patients. Um, much better than the medical management. And if you look here, only one of these original 48 patients or about 2% attained the primary outcome. Another way of looking at this is, uh, you know, at the end of two years, there was a total of 72 patients with SCS and 34 or just under half of these patients achieved their primary outcome. And um, this, you know, is significantly better than medical management, which at the end of two years only had uh, one patient out of a total of 15 attain their primary outcome. And this is just one uh, graph here. Uh, showing the long-term results of leg and back pain specifically. Uh, you'll remember that uh, folks began, uh, the folks recruited for this study were primarily leg pain patients. Um, they started about 7.6, and at the end of the trial at 24 months, they were just about, just above four. Uh, so assuming this is about a 3.5 decrease, this amounts to about a 46% decrease, which was pretty comparable to the six month uh, results and it's good to see that that has stayed constant over two years. Uh, for the back pain, however, it's a little bit of a different story. Um, they started at 5.45 and at the end of 24 months, their back pain was just underneath four. You know, you take this as a half point decrease, this amounts to about a 9% decrease. Um, you'll remember at six months, that decrease is about at 25%. So you see perhaps over two years is a little bit of a wearing off uh, with regard to back pain, so much so that you see at the end of two years that the improvement in back pain was uh, no longer statistically significant. Uh, Long-term outcomes for health-related quality of life, functional status uh, did show improvement at two months, and as with the original six-month results, there were no change in, in pain medications. So, you know, what about back pain? You know, there's, a, certainly we see a lot of folks who their primary complaint is back pain. So uh, this group uh, wanted to look at, you know, specifically uh, how well does SES treat back pain? You know, the traditional teaching uh, for SES that I received is that it's, it's superior for this radicular type of neuropathic pain uh, compared to just you know, primarily axial back pain. And you know, the RCTs that I had uh, cited earlier, they specifically excluded patients whose main complaint was axial back pain. And uh, as mentioned in this process trial before, the initial six month uh, data was pretty a promising of a significant 25% decrease in back pain. However, at 24 months, this was no longer significant. So this trial uh, was conducted in Europe, Canada, South America, and the US. They randomized uh, over 200 patients uh, to SCS or continued medical management. The criteria were very similar to the original uh, process trial. 
only caveat here is uh, folks here now had a predominant low back pain diagnosis versus a predominant radicular uh, pain diagnosis. And their primary outcome was a 50% or greater reduction in low back pain at 6, 12, and 24 months. And they also looked at other outcomes such as leg pain, uh, health-related quality of life, and functional status. And here are the primary outcomes for a six-month follow-up. You'll see that 110 patients were randomized to SCS, uh, 108 were randomized to non-op. Um, at six months, they had a, what I would think is kind of a little bit of a high dropout. They had uh, 18 patients uh, drop out, 13 of which were discontinued for either uh, patient withdrawal or investigator withdrawal of consent and five patients just missed their, their six-month follow-up. So take that for what it's worth. Um, if we do intention to treat analysis, you'll see that uh, only 15 of these original 110 patients met the uh, primary outcome of a 50% or more decrease in low back pain. So it's only about 14%. That is statistically significantly better than non-op. You'll see just under 5% met their uh, primary goal. And these are the results at six months. You'll see that you have a pretty, you know, 20, which was about the percent decrease in back pain you saw in the, the process trial at six months. Uh, secondary outcomes, uh, improvements in leg pain as well as health-related quality of life and functional outcome, uh, which we kind of already knew from the, the original process trial. Um, what about long-term results? Um, as mentioned, there was 110 patients assigned to SCS originally at six months, 18 patients dropped out for a total of 92. At uh, 12 months, uh, even more folks dropped out to where you only had 68 patients, and at 24 months, there was further dropout. Um, you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, I tend to be a little bit harsher. You know, if, if I see a lot of dropout, I would, would kind of qualify that as a maybe perhaps a failure. Um, so the results here, the amount of folks who attained the primary outcome was 18 at 12 months. Uh, 18 divided by 68 is about a fourth of patients attaining the primary outcome. Um, as mentioned, um, I maybe take a, a harsher view of it. <laughs> In uh, intention to treat analysis, if you divide uh, 18 over the original 110, it only amounts out to 16% you know, of patients meeting the primary outcome. And at uh, 24 months, it drops a little bit. Uh, 13 over 110 is about 12% uh, attaining the primary outcome of 50% uh, or more improvement in axial low back pain. And so, you know, what are some issues with SCS trials? You know, um, is SCS, is comparing SCS to continued non-op or medical management fair? You know, if you think about it, perhaps not. You know, all these patients who are being funneled for evaluation of SCS have kind of by definition failed medical management. So you're, you're comparing kind of a known, you know, non-optimal treatment to, to this uh, device. And then that kind of goes into this, you know, are you able to get a true placebo effect? Are you able to completely blind patients to the effect of this? Certainly traditionally like low frequency stimulation which induces this paresthesia effect. Uh, generally speaking, you, you can't have an adequate placebo or, or blinding um, phase. And then, you know, the role of industry we touched upon a little bit earlier, no doubt that um, these device companies help, you know, push the field forward. Uh, but, you know, I would, uh, you know, caution when you read these uh, papers that a lot of these um, investigations are either funded or, or directly authored by the uh, company um, making the device. So there is the possibility of conflicts of interest. Um, so the future, you know, what does the future hold? There's a newer stimulation modality such as uh, burst and high frequency, which are different from traditional kind of paresthesia inducing stimulation paradigms. 
which uh, deliver therapy without uh, necessarily the patient knowing them. And this could allow for you know, a true placebo or a sham controlled arm. Um, just two studies here I'll touch upon briefly. The SENSA trial randomized 200 patients uh, with a variety of uh, kind of diagnosis, failed back syndrome, CRIPS, to traditional paresthesia inducing stimulation and high frequency, which doesn't have it. And it showed that 80% uh, of patients with this uh, high frequency stimulation had 50% or more improvement in their back and leg com pain compared to only about 50% of the folks who had this traditional lower frequency stimulation. And then the sunburst trial uh, looked at 100 patients with, uh, again, a kind of a, a grab bag of diagnoses, but mainly failed back surgery syndrome. And they showed that burst stimulation led to a uh, VAS decrease of 5.1, which was non-inferior uh, to traditional paresthesia-inducing stimulation. So, you know, what are the, the take-home messages here? I think, you know, SCS is well established for many neuropathic, vasculopathic conditions. I think with any surgery, you know, patient selection, making sure they're an adequate candidate for the operation leads you to have the kind of the, the highest rate of success, you know, within failed back surgery syndrome. I would say that, you know, radicular neuropathic pain probably responds a little bit better than, you know, isolated, you know, axial back pain. You know, for patients who have both, I generally counsel, you know, if, if we did this and improved your back pain but did nothing to touch your low back pain, would this be an acceptable outcome for you? And, and that's, uh, I think, you know, when you put it that way, it helps patients kind of think about expectations of therapy. And then certainly, you know, there's newer stimulation paradigms and uh, parameters uh, that show promise in, in early investigation. And certainly, um, I think, you know, the, the field of spinal cord stimulation, as you saw with the clinical trials uh, site, is, is certainly growing. And with that, I'll uh, take any questions. Well, thank you, Tony. Well, a really great comprehensive review, and your clinical expertise also was so much welcome. So uh, let me start there. Um, uh, I have zero problems in my own clinical practice. I found that uh, spinal cord stimulators for patients with neuropathic type pain has been a very welcome addition. Mm -hmm. not, a, not a question, and uh, frequently these are very frustrated patients. So this has been a clear expansion. How, what I've never understood is how can the proponents of this technology proclaim that this helps back pain? I, I've never uh, understood that rationale. Yeah, yeah, and you see with the the uh, the results, it, it's it's pretty modest, right? It's you know only you know thirteen percent of patients achieve this primary outcome, which you know they say is you know I, I'll buy it. I'm sure it's significant in the terms of statistics, but you know. It, it, it's certainly not like neuropathic pain, right, no. where you see much higher success rates. So, you know, generally, like, uh, you know, when I see patients, I would counsel them, you know, if you have isolated back pain, I'm, I'm not sure this would be necessarily the right therapy for you. If you have kind of combined uh, leg and back pain, I would counsel, you know, I think this could help your, your leg pain, but I wanna be clear with you, like, it could help your back pain, but, you know, I'm not sure that it, it will, and, and certainly, you know, you may, you may notice that in the beginning, things may, may feel good, but certainly when it comes to just this low back pain, it could wear off over time. Now, the, the next question I have is, uh, goes back to the trial. So, in theory, um, these spinal cord stimulators allow for a great opportunity to have a blinded trial, because yeah. uh, you have a device there. In the fine print, which I've honestly not read, how far do they go in simulating the real deal? Do they actually both get a stimulator pack? Do they both get leads and then they just turn on and off? Or how does that work? So some of these newer stimulation parameters with the high frequency, they can um, induce stimulation without the typical paresthesia. So you're, in theory, more blinded. Um, so some of these newer trials, they will, you know, they'll sham control them. Some of them, will be more placebo where you might not have to like, you, you might get it implanted, but you might not do a, you know, thing to, to charge the battery or whatnot. So, 
you know, that might be thought of as a little less kind of uh, blinded if a lot of these patients are pretty you know, wise to, you know, the device and the technology. And if they're, they're not having to charge their device, they might, you know, inadvertently kind of become unblinded to the to pr procedure. So in theory, a great uh, concept in practice, probably not so completely blinded. Yeah, I think with the newer stimulation parameters, there's the, there's more potential for that, definitely. So then uh, let's talk about these trials. So a common uh, theme that I've seen in patients uh, reporting how they uh, went about this spinal cord stimulator was that they were told by their practitioner, we can always just do a trial and see how it works. Mm -hmm. And then they had the device placed after the trial looked pretty good. Right. And then they were disappointed afterwards. Right. So you opened up this door to the topic of placebo effect. Sure. Can you expand on that a little bit more? Yeah, and uh, you know, certainly, like I want to highlight, you know, probably the the best results here we have for um, neuropathic pain. Here's the the process trial looking at you know, how how well did your leg pain improve, right? And 50% met this kind of predefined goal of 50% uh, or more decrease, right? And in order to you know proceed from the trial to the permanent implant period, they in theory have to meet that 50% goal during it. So you see, so in theory, you had 50 patients available for follow-up. In theory, all 50 of these patients achieved this goal during the trial period. And certainly, you know, um, you know pain is a complicated thing. You know, I, I don't wanna, you know, make light of it, but pain is a little bit of a pain, right? There are certainly, um, uh, physical components as well as you know mental components, and I know that you know here we we do neuropsychological screening to make sure people are good candidates for this. But you know I think especially with these patients, they're in pain so long, they're they're seeking a lot of opinions, they're seeking a lot of things. A lot of them maybe have this perhaps incorrect idea that this may be a silver bullet, and so maybe they're putting a lot of stock or weight in this one week trial. And, you know, the uh, investigators certainly for the CRIPS trial noted that maybe perhaps patients were exaggerating their effect, right? There may be this, well, you know, I kind of have this predefined notion of what I, what I need to get to have this thing implanted, you know, you know, maybe it was only 30, maybe it was only 50, you know, that's just my kind of sense on it. That's a really valuable insight. For me, this is an opening uh, insight into patients' uh, psychology, and that is, uh, we call it a placebo effect, but I probably call it a validation bias. Uh, there seems to be a certain subset of patients who kind of want to validate their experiences by having a additional technology put in, and sure. um, they, they seem to be very keen on getting this almost and trying to sort out who is a true respondent and who will be. Right just kind of um, trying to somehow get some form of a psychological help from having another procedure done, I'm not sure how to differentiate that. Yeah, it's, it's, it's tough, I have to say. Um, it's, uh, it's not always uh, easy to tease out, you know, who is kind of gonna have a, a good outcome and who may be less so. I was intrigued to hear about your neuropsych testing. What do you use? Uh, maybe, Glenn, you could, uh, you send these to Dr. Famey, is that right? They do a... Prior to any trial that's being done, uh, he does a great job of uh, uh, for us. Uh, so that's needed for any authorization uh, before our trial is is uh, is done. Now here is a uh, very important question. Uh, there's so many questions here. This is a very good topic, and thank you for your expertise. And we'll have to close with that question again. Dr. Dillon knocks it out of the park. Great questions, Dr. Dillon. Thank you. So what is the difference, I'm reading verbatim, of a spinal cord stimulator for paraplegics you know, with that famous transition zone pain, and um, what is the difference of spinal cord stimulation for failed backs with neuropathic pain? Why does one work, the latter, work so much better than the prior? And then I'm gonna expand the question to the second part of his question. But so what was the reason why this would not work so well in this transition zone pain that paraplegics frequently have? 
It, it's hard to know. Um, I would surmise maybe, you know, due to the paraplegia, there's some sort of, you know, pathology with the nervous system itself, right? You know, this is stimulating the dorsal columns with the paraplegia. You may have some sort of, you know, axonal, you know, Wallerian degeneration, you know, cephalatier injury, which could affect, you know, the efficacy of uh, the stimulation. Yeah, because that, uh, that's clearly something that we're struggling with, and I have a lot of spinal cord injury patients in my practice also. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'd love to have greater insights and help with those patients. Sure. They're wonderful patients. They're very motivated. Rapid fire answers. We have to all go on to our clinical okay. practice, but the questions keep coming. Uh, so the other one is uh, give us an outlook on what you've heard about using spinal cord stimulators for paraplegic patients to try to regain function. So there have been kind of these multi, I've seen some of those patients now, multi-lead placements with an attempt at trying to somehow get functional restoration. Yeah, no, I, and I, I've read about it too, and it certainly shows promise. Um, you know, I think for, you know, spinal cord stimulation, as the uh, field kind of grows, and you certainly have these newer, more novel stimulation parameters that you're able to, to do more, um, I think, you know, the sky's the limit in terms of paraplegia, uh, and time will tell, you know, they certainly have shown uh, promising results for this high frequency stimulation in uh, diabetic neuropathy, uh, failed back surgery syndrome, and it would be interesting, I'm not aware if that's been applied to uh, paraplegia yet, but it'd be interesting to see that applied. Okay. And then the other question was, um, <clears throat> Uh, then the other question uh, was, I see more and more cervical spinal cord stimulators placed. Is that something that's validated in the literature? I'm kind of concerned because I've seen very compressed cords on yeah. some of the CT myelograms. Sure. Um, yeah, that has been validated, and certainly in the, uh, the CRIPS uh, study here I mentioned, they did investigate folks with hand pain, so, you know, upper extremity CRIPS. So it has been something that's validated, but you do raise a... Uh, you know, a salient point that, you know, if you put a, a epidural paddle there, that, that it could uh, lead to some spinal cord compression in the cervical spine. Well, thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Wong. This is a really insightful uh, study. Anything else you want to add from your end, Yev? Yeah, actually, um, uh, I just want to say the, the research into paraplegia and quadriplegia with spinal cord stimulation is, is a really active area, and we did some at UCLA. Uh, that's actually the... Uh, institution where, where that line of research originated. Um, there's, there's some pretty impressive results where uh, patients who are Asia B or better uh, regain very substantial function, uh, upper and lower extremity with, uh, uh, with spinal cord stimulation, both with implantable devices and transcutaneous. Uh, stimulation, but um, the current hurdle that, that remains mostly unsolved is the people who start at Asia A. Uh, they tend to get very little benefit from even the most aggressive uh, stimulation regimen. Thank you, Yev. Well, we'll have to come to a close. Much more to talk. Um, uh, very good questions by our audience. Thank you, Dr. Dillon. Thank you, Dr. Medisa Madera. Uh, and uh, I can't go into all the questions. I apologize. We'll have to run down to the OR ourselves uh, now uh, to be continued. But thank sure. you, Dr. Wong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.